Okay. So yeah, so uh a few months ago, right? Yeah, I, I got this piece of uh a broken equipment. It's called a, a DME from my flying club. So uh out of curiosity, right? I decided to open up and see uh, uh what, what is it about like, inside there and how does it work? Uh? Okay, so uh this actually is a quite a pretty complex piece of equipment, and I actually have to go through a bit of theory uh, before I can before you guys can understand what how why it was designed this way. So uh, DME basically stands for distance measuring equipment. So as the name suggests, it's to basically measure distance, right? So this is how, how it works. Uh. It's a uh, DME, this equipment is uh, installed on the aircraft, right? So uh, you want to find a distance to a certain uh, ground station. So this is how it works. The aircraft first uh, transmit a signal to this ground station. Then uh, the ground station will reply back. So uh, based on the, the time difference between the time that it sends out the, the signal and the time it receives, right? This DME equipment can actually determine how far the, the aircraft is from this particular station. Okay, so of course there are some limitations to this. First, uh, it has to be line of sight. So there, there cannot be any obstruction between the aircraft and then the, and the station. The next thing is this is actually a sun range, right? Because you're actually measuring the distance from the aircraft to this point. So when the, whatever distance that the pilot gets from the equipment is actually this, it's not actually ground distance. However, in practice, right, the, this uh, height above the ground is pretty small compared to the ground distance. So actually it can be, it's, very, it's a, just a minor difference between the slant distance and the ground distance. Okay, so, so ground stations, right? There are actually uh, many of them scattered around the world. So uh, for DME, right? They are usually co-located with another ground station. So uh, there are two types of ground-based navigation stations. One is called VOR. It's a very high autonomy directional radio. Right, range radio, as well as a Takan. So this a Takan is used by military only. So a DME is usually a uh, equipment that is uh, co-located with this particular station. So VOR and Takan, right, they, they provide bearing information for the aircraft. But uh, as we know, if you know a bearing to something, right, you still, you still don't know where exactly you are because you don't know how far you are from it. So that's like, where DME comes in. So when you have a bearing to a certain station, you know how far you are from the certain station, you know where the aircraft is, right? So for DME, they operate at these frequencies, right? So uh, there is, they use two separate frequencies for uh, answering to the, for interrogating the station as well as re receiving a reply. So they operate at this range, but for the DME, they operate at a slightly uh, smaller range compared to the full range that the DME uses. And the ground reply frequency is also somewhat similar. You'll notice, right? So why, why is that the case? Because the interrogation and the answer frequency, they are exactly 63 megahertz apart. So let's say uh, if a particular station is listening to, let's say, 1025 megahertz, on a, if it's using an X channel, it will reply black at 962 and so on. You can see. So the, the, the DME uses two channels. Uh, so uh, I'll come to that later. Why, why is there two, two separate channels? Right? So basically, uh, about 1,000 plus megahertz. So uh, this table looks very big, but basically it means that uh, there's a fixed mapping from VR to DME. So for, for remember that I said that there's, this, there's actually a co-location here. So for VOR, right, VOR actually uses a certain set of frequencies to provide bearing information for the aircraft. So since they're almost always co-located to each other, so let's say, right, you can see this column here. So this is a set of VOR frequencies. So this is an internationally set standard. When there's a VOR frequency, for example, of a 108 megahertz, this is one, 108 here, the aircraft, the associated DME frequency is 1041. And the ground reply frequency is 978. So these two frequencies are exactly 63 megahertz apart. So as to why there's X and Y, right? Because basically X means the VOR frequency ending with 0, 0, 0 0.00. And Y means the VOR frequency ending with 0 0.05. Yeah. So there's a fixed mapping. Okay, so what about Singapore, right? So Singapore, right, we actually have a few stations like that. So I'll just go briefly go through what are these five. So 
for the first one, right, is a uh, Papa uniform. It's basically Pulau Ubin. Uh. There's actually a VR station there. So, and they have a VR frequency of 115.1. You can see this is an aviation map. You can see 115.1 is listed here. So the DME frequency, right, is not published to the pilot. But because, because there's already a fixed mapping, it's a given. The table is already known to the equipment. Then we have another two more. One is at Tertong and one is St. John. St. John means St. John's Island. So you can see these are the frequencies here. As for the other two, right, these two are most, they are special. Right? They are actually Takan. So these are the military use ones. The one's at Tengah Air Base, the one's Pai Lebar Air Base. 113.9, 116.3. So with these five DME stations, right, if let's say the pilot is flying Singapore, they can use that to determine how far are they from, this, from the particular stations. Okay, so how does it look like, right? So this is how, this is the equipment here in operation. So currently, it is tuned to 116.3. So 116.3 is actually the... VOR frequency of, of Pile by base, but the equipment doesn't use 116.3. 116.3 is just a shorthand. Internally, it, will, it knows what is the mapping to the associated DME frequency. So the, now you look above, this, above the DME, right? There's this, uh, this is actually a GPS unit. So you can see that this aircraft current position is here. So this is currently above the waypoint SETI. So SETI is here. Okay. So if let's say down the current at the currently the aircraft is here, right? It's about 5.1 nautical miles away from Pile by base. Here, here is about 5.1 nautical miles away. So uh you can think of it as times 1.82. Uh, you can get the uh, how many kilometers. Okay. So this is how the inter interrogation process looks like. So when the aircraft wants to uh, talk to a DAB station it will send a pair of pulses, right? So each pulse has a wave of 3.5 microseconds at a fixed spacing of 12 microseconds. So the DME station is perpetually listening. So whenever it's, it uh, sees that all oh, that two pulse, two pulse pairs are directed at it, it will wait 50 microseconds delay and then it will reply back to the aircraft at the associated reply frequency. So the aircraft will then know uh, this piece of this delay, how far away it is. Okay, so okay, so this is how the equipment looks like on the back. Uh. Uh, for, to the technician, right, uh, they will usually consult a uh, maintainer's manual like this. So you can see these are the, the, the pins, uh, the output pins uh, of the DME. So to power it, right, uh, they will consult this particular uh, table here. You can see uh, it requires uh, 14 to 28 volts of uh, voltage power input, and then you can end the ground as well. So it can accept 14 to 20 inputs to power this. Okay, so uh, with that, right, uh, I decided to curious uh, what was inside, so I open up and this is the first thing that I see. So you can see that uh, on the, the left is just one big circuit board, and then uh, here we have an RF section. It's uh, completely shielded using this in the metal cage. Okay, so I before I, I went deeper into the teardown, I uh, looked into into the maintenance manual to see what's the system architecture. So you can see this uh, is an extremely centralized thing. There's a uh, one uh, microprocessor here. Uh, it should actually should be called microcontroller, right? And everything else, the the RF section, everything will connect to it in the displays as well. Okay, so let's first start with the microcontroller, right? So I. I googled what is this uh, part number over there, and then I found out that it's actually made by this company, Mostek. Uh, Mostek is already bought over by ST, so that's why, why you can see the ST logo here. Okay, so you can see that uh, it's relatively pr primitive compared to what whatever you have today. Uh, uh, quite, quite old, 1977. Okay, so, okay, then the next thing is uh, the first impression of the device, right? So let's see, right? So this, this is the device power on in the plane. You can see that the, the display uh it, it the display is not constant. It there's a, some kind of uh interleaving in the display, right? So of course that got me curious. In okay, this is because of the camera frame rate. In actually, when you use a naked eye and see, you wouldn't be able to perceive this flickering. Okay. So when we open up, 
I can see this is see that each of these have, have their own segments. Okay. So based on what the maintenance manual says, right? There's this uh, interleaving of displaying the of the display is actually deliberate. They do not uh, show it in a straight sequence one two three zero one two three and so on. They actually do it in autonomous zero three six one four seven two five zero three six one four seven two five, right? So so that uh, the human eye will be unlikely to perceive this flickering. Very interesting. Yes. Okay, so. For this particular display, right, it's actually something called gas discharge. It is not an LED display. So uh, in that time, LED displays, I don't think it was common. I'm not sure whether LEDs were invented at that time, 1970s. But uh, the, this, in order to have a, a very bright display that can be seen by the pilot under all uh, lighting conditions, they had to use a gas discharge to ensure it's bright enough. So the voltage that they typically operate at is a minus 100 to 100, to a very high voltage DC. Yeah, it's so at this kind of uh, uh, higher level voltages, right? It's not possible for the microcontroller to drive them directly. So that's why they have actually a uh, few uh, drivers. So, okay, the first thing, right, is that uh, we want to select which uh, digits you want to control any one time. Because remember, there are several digits here, right? And it's, if you have uh, so many uh, control lines to it, the microcontroller will not have enough lines. So they actually have to select, select it and drive them one by one. So they are actually uh, eight, eight digits inside. They actually use a combinator logic multiplexer. So they just use three lines and they control eight lines to determine which of the eight digits they want to control at a particular time. Then after that, there is actually a common anode, U315. So U315 is here. So this one uh, is basically means now I'm driving that one. So the multiplexer controls this anode. After that, this they have an individual cathode. So the individual cathode is to control the segments because they are each uh, digit. You can see they are about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven segments here. So they have a use. They use another IC to to generate the minus one hundred volt. Okay, so uh, for the RF sections, right? This to me is uh, it's quite complicated. Okay, so I I'm not an RF engineer, but I'll try my best to explain uh, what I can understand so far based on what the maintenance manual says. So uh, for the top right, uh, this is the receiver portion. Then the bottom one, this is the transmitter and diplexer section. So a diplexer means that uh, this it allows the transmitter and receiver to both use the antenna at the same time uh, while make, ensuring that their frequencies are isolated from each other. Of course, this can only work if the frequencies are significantly different from each other. But this is guaranteed because the system says that the transmit and, and receive frequency are exactly 63 megahertz apart. Okay, so this is uh, what the I, I what the uh, personal block diagram I got from the from the maintenance manual. So let's first start with uh, from the left. So the C the frequency is selected from the the micro from the from the pilot, right? So that input goes to the microcontroller and the microcontroller controls an RF synthesizer. So this is, you can think of it as a C. It sets the frequency, half, half the transmitter frequency, 520.5 to 575 over here. Okay. Then after that, it goes through a series of amplifiers. So there's a continuous wave amplifier and a final pulse amplifier. So continuous wave is always on. Final pulse amplifier means that it's it always on at certain intervals. You can think something as like PWM. It only ons at certain, certain time. Okay. And then you send it over the transmitter section. Then uh, since that they only synthesize half the frequency, there's actually a frequency doubler to bring this up to the actual interrogation frequency. Then they amplify and they send it out to the diplexer, which will then send it to the antenna. Okay, so with that, that's, uh, I actually cross-reference the bomb this schematic and to find out why, where are these components. Are. So this is the buffer, the continuous wave amplifiers, the pulse amplifiers, the frequency doubler, the final amplifier, and then the diplexer. So that's for the transmit section. Okay, so what about the receive section? So the receive section is, is a bit more complicated, right? So you can, uh, they actually divided into two main parts. First is a signal conditioning stage, right? And then the, uh, the second part is what I would call the post signal conditioning stage. Okay, so the first part, the signal comes from the, the antenna to the diplexer, 
and then goes to the band pass filter. Okay, so the band pass filter is basically to filter out whatever that is uh, not desired. Then there's a first stage as amplifier, right, to bring up the frequency to something that can be pro that can be processed. And then they have something called a mixer here. So the thing about this uh, mixer, right, is actually try to get, the objective of this mixer is to try to get a 63 megahertz signal out of that because so that it's easier for the subsequent uh, circuitry to process. So how does it work, right, is that they use a principle called the heterodyning. So they actually have, heterodyning basically means to mix two signals and then you get another two more signals out of that. So they mix, the first one is the receive frequency, goes in. Another one is the transmit frequency. So heterodyning, you get actually two. One of them is a sum and one of them is a difference. So the objective is we want to get a difference. And since the transmit and frequency and the receive frequencies are guaranteed to 63 megahertz apart, we can use that property. So once, up, once it comes out of the mixer, we have two signals, right? So then here is where we have an inductor. It is a, it is a low impedance of 63 megahertz. So it basically it means filters everything except for 63 megahertz. Okay, so what about others? So uh, let me briefly go through what are the components, where are the components first? So they have a bunch of amplifiers. There's something called a video detector, another amplifier, and there's a logic driver. Okay, and there's something called the automatic gain control. So with that, I will go through what are those about. So for the video detector section here, so the, the purpose of this is to detect the 3.5 per microsecond pulse pair, right? So the 3.5 microsecond pulse pair was essentially this. They're trying to detect this particular one. Okay. Okay. Then after that, they, they need to amplify the signal. Then uh, they need to com com uh, convert it to a logic level. Because this, this data decoder here, right, this is actually a normal IC. So they need to make sure that it's amplified to the correct level that this decoder can actually use. Then they also have a means to actually uh, influence the amplification here. Because uh, sometimes the, the, the amplitude can vary greatly. And so they need a way to influence it. The, the decoder has a way to influence it. And then uh, this signal has also a way to influence it. So they actually affect this uh, amplifier to add, they adjust. So they automatically adjust how much amplification they will do to ensure that the signal here comes up at an appropriate level. Okay, so that, that's uh, quite a lot. <laughs> so uh, this is, I have uh, three, three major thoughts my conclusion. Uh, like, so they, they apparently there's a lot of thought went to this. So DMV infrastructure is actually pretty old. It's actually, uh, I would say, if I remember right, it's a, about 50 years, more than 50 years old already. So they actually put a lot of thought into the frequency selection so that the device on the device side, right, is easier for it to process. Then the uh, RF engineering is a very complex thing. I think I just barely scratched the surface of uh, what this device can do and it's about. And then uh, the last thing is that I'm, I'm actually impressed, uh, basically, that uh, engineers at the time, in the 1970s, they can do something so complex as this. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's that's uh that's the end of my presentation. Hi. Thank you, King Ming. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> uh okay, anybody have a uh, questions for him? Not a question, just a comment. It's actually on this slide. Uh the, the reason it's called video. Okay, uh, yeah. Is tied up with the bandwidth required. So the if you've got a, a detector or an amplifier that's only having to deal with a voice channel that's three kilohertz or maybe 15 kilohertz wide, then you can use much simpler circuitry. But because you're having to perform uh, fairly precise phase measurements on the transmitted and received pulses, you can't afford to have a narrow bandwidth mm. component um, making the edges of the, the pulse soggy. And so you need a, a high bandwidth detector or amplifier to correctly process the pulse as received before you can perform the, uh, the comparison with what you sent. Okay. And so that, that's the reason for needing a 
a wideband amplifier or, or what is to this day still called a video amplifier. It just it just means an amplifier or detector with uh, much more bandwidth, typically several megahertz, than you'd normally use for uh, narrowband audio. Okay. Good. Help to the end. Please. Great. Any, any other question? Well, if there's no questions, let's thank King Ming for putting this uh, presentation in less than a week, actually. So thank you, King Ming. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of Hackware. Uh, if there's uh, presentations, if there's anyone who wants to bring up anything, uh, you may do so now. Uh, but otherwise, please uh, feel free to stay and network uh, and yeah, chat with each other. I think we'll keep this, uh, this Zoom chat open, Zoom meeting open. And if you guys wish to present in the next hardware, I believe we're going to have it next month. Uh, do PM us. Thank you very much for, your, uh, for attending and I hope everybody stays safe.